So thank you so much for having us. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, we want to say thanks to Rosa and to Annette and to Rick and to Lucas, the whole team. It's a real pleasure. And Heather's talk was beyond our expectations. It was so wonderful. We're really excited to have that material to build on. And that's what we're going to do. So we will be talking about 3D printing. But we're going to talk about a whole load of other things. We're going to talk a bit about the fruition of our project. And then we're going to show you our manifesto video. And then we're going to unpack some of the concepts in that video. So. Um, yeah, I can't go next now. I might have to just click. No, that's not, no. I don't want to do that. Is it working? All right. Um, Are we having yeah. a soundtrack? Is this what is happening? Is this coming from? No, no, it okay. can't come. Okay, introduction music. Yay. <laughs> um, so, hi. Um, I, I am going to talk a little bit about kind of the format of our presentation today. So every time we've presented this project so far, um, in the last, I guess, seven, eight months, um, we've tried to do it differently, like at new concepts or way that we think about it and, and think through our project. And for the sake of this um, presentation and then the relationship between kind of trying to bring together practice and theory, um, today we're going to um, kind of like have a section where we mostly like focus on the theory and the research that um, went on uh, the writing of the text of the manifesto um, and then the process of the creation of the video, etc. And then I will um, talk about a project that I've been working on um, in the last one year, um, which hopefully can be seen as an example of some of the research related to additivism that we've been, we've been doing. Um, one of the things that um, has been very important and interesting to us is um, kind of as, as we're developing this project and the concept of additivism, uh, which we will explain um, in a bit, it's been really important for us to kind of constantly loop back and interrupt ourselves and these concepts and rethink really through them. So today is kind of similar as, as we are um, unfolding some of, some of these, these topics and concepts. We're hoping that you will think with us through it and we can have a discussion um, and hopefully points of conflict in a way that, uh, that we are thinking about um, these, these relationships. Um, one of the uh, kind of this, this concept of responsibility is, is one of the things that I think we will be referring back to. But also maybe it's a good way to contextualize uh, our project, um, especially because of some of the talks that, things that you were saying, um, but also this relationship between this, this collective imagination, ways that we should rethink um, through our, our relationship with, with, with the world around us and, and things that are happening. But Donna Haraway uses this um, uh, kind of word, which is response ability, the ability to respond. Um, but not just from this, perhaps, activism way of just responding to political, environmental issues around us, but I think she, she goes beyond that and think about it as a, as a bigger picture. Um, kind of this idea of staying with trouble and changing something completely fundamentally to be able to respond. But also um, this, this thing about each of us as humans on this planet thinking through this relationship that we have and what this concept of responsibility means in, in that sense, in this collective resistance, collective imagination, um, etc. So I am going to um, start with a project that um, I've been working on I'm having trouble going next year. So the problem is that when I'm here, it's I need to see I my notes. So it won't. You have it, to go to the left and click. Yeah, but then it doesn't it doesn't go here. Does it make sense? Yeah. Do you want me to do that? All right. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about a project that I started um, in 2013 and 2014, which was kind of the, the start of also Daniel and I's conversation around 3D printing, the radical potential of 3D printing. Um, and uh, Daniel did an interview with me on Rhizome about this project, and this is kind of where our whole conversation about additivism um, started. 
Um, so this this was a project um, called Dark Matter, and the I remember like the first time that I saw something being 3D printed. 3D printing technology has been around for 30 years, but the first time that I saw something being 3D printed, I was really amazed by just watching this process of something digital, um, layer by layer you know, becoming to this like physical shape. And that was like a really important moment for me. But the first thing that I thought about was, so what would it mean if you could 3D print something that is, let's say, um, taboo or forbidden in a country like Iran? Like, what does that mean as a potential? And I, I was really excited about that idea. Um, and I started gathering a list of um, things and objects that are, um, con are, that are banned and then tabu in Iran, which, for, for example, you know, from, from dogs that um, you're not supposed to walk your dog in the street, you can get a ticket for doing that. So if you have a dog, you have to like, keep it inside your home. Or um, to like Barbies and, for example, Simpsons. I remember when I was growing up in Iran, they were banned because they, they promote these uh, Western uh, cultural values um, from the Iranian government's perspective that they don't want kids to know about or, or learn about. Um, or satellite dishes, which, um, the, again, the government constantly brings them down because this is how people can have access to Western channels. In, in the last, I think, five, six years, my mom has had the satellite dish of, of her house brought down by, by the government, like, three, four times, but then she goes and buy a new one. So it's this constant <laughs> battle back and forth between people and government. But um, what was also really interesting to me was this idea of being able to archive and, and document these things. Um, but I was approaching it from this more of a kind of humorous way of thinking about it, uh, through like combining um, a selection of these uh, objects or things, and creating this, I guess, humorous juxtaposition between them. Um, and I think th that notion of irrationality was really important for me, uh, because when you, as I'm telling you this story, and you can just imagine how ridiculous it is dealing with these things. Like, when you step out of it and th can think about it, um, there is like something really irrational and, and ridiculous about these things being being forbidden and, and taboos. Um, so then I worked on um, this this first one, which is. No, you have to go. <laughs> I'm being very bad at this. Oops. No, that one. You already showed all my good images. Does this go back? You're no, going no. backward. Okay, there we go. This is always hap okay. Just, so yeah, you're just using the yeah, arrows. Use All right. Um, so this is the first one: a dog wearing a dildo with satellite dish. Um, but <laughs> this 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 thing is so famous. I always get this search on my website, which is like Morishin dog dildo. Um, but. <laughs> Um, it was, you know, again, this kind of aspect of putting this together and, and create this, this other thing from it, right? Um, I mean, some of these are, are not functional. I mean, Dilo would be, but like the dog and satellite dish are not. But it was about creating this kind of like moment of rethinking through, through these things. And what, what does it mean when you combine them and now they're this like new thing? But also, what does it mean to be able to send an OBJ file or a STL file, I don't know, to Iran and then people can... Uh, print some of these things that are that are forbidden. And I was really excited about that idea. So then the next one is a Simpson uh, Buddha. Again, Buddha being uh, forbidden in Iran because it's promoting another religion. Um, and then Barbie VHS. I really like the VHS story because I remember, like VHS has such an important uh, place in my memory because I remember we had this guy, it was kind of like a drug deal. This guy would come to our house and he would, he had this like case and a black plastic bag and he would bring all these like movies and my parents would choose these movies and then they would watch it and then he would come back and you know, they would return it and get a, get a new thing. It was kind of like this weird drug deal or whatever. Um, and this is uh, just a ham or like pig, again, ham being um, considered dirty in Islam and gun. Um, and so these, these relationships were like really important for me, but then I, I wanted to expand it to other countries. So these are um, things combined, which are um, in North Korea, Saudi Arabia, um, and then Iran and China. All right, so from here, um, after Daniel and I had all this conversation through the, when, when we, you were doing the interview with me, right? And we were talking about kind of the use of 3D printing and, and the fact that as soon as you say 3D printing, one of the first things that people start talking about 
is the 3D printed gun, and I'm pretty sure most of you have heard about this. Um, and we were kind of really frustrated by, by, by um, this, this kind of um, notion of, I guess, radicality with a project like this, because we were really interested in rethinking <coughs> radicality. The radicality being uh, connected to violence was something that we were not interested in, but we wanted to think about other provocative, radical, interesting projects that um, that you could talk about when you talked about 3D printing and this like both, I guess, dystopian and utopian potential of, of, of this thing called the 3D printer. Um, when, so with, with this thing, the, the very interesting, I mean, if you understand the process of 3D printing, what's really interesting is that to 3D print this thing and get it to actually work, it will be so much more um, complications and work than just walking to Walmart in the US and buying a gun. Um, but the freak out kind of thing that happened with people just being like, oh my god, now I can 3D print a gun, this is like the end of the world. I think one is this uh, not understanding the technology, right? As, as soon as you have this new technology and not understanding this like process, and I was, I was saying like how hard it would be to get this to actually work and fun function and get 3D printed. Um, Maybe that was probably one of the reasons. Um, but what's true is that, yes, you can email this file, and this file can move through um, laptops and, and, and files and you know, be accessible to people. Um, am I forgetting any, any point in, in this one? No. no? OK, so another project that we were really excited about, um, which is kind of, this is, like I think, one of the first projects that we actually talked about. This is a project by um, Golan Levin. And in this project, he um, basically, it's, it's a universal um, construction kit. So what he's doing is that um, he is creating this kit where, um, I think, 20 different um, kit, construction kits um, could be connected to each other. So he's talking about how you can open out this system that is already a closed system. Like each of these kids are made to only work together, you know, as like these pieces of puzzle. But he's talking about how you can actually expand that, how you can create this open system um, by, um, yeah, allowing this thing to be 3D printed, and then you kind of create this connection between all, all these different um, construction kits for, for, for kids. And, and the openness of this project, um, and also being accessible free and online, was something that was really important and, and interesting to us. Yeah, so um, another project that I think was really inspiring to us is this project uh, called Becoming a Human 3D Printer by Laura Devendorf. And she builds, uh, she's like working on creating this kind of um, human army of 3D printer. But what she's really interested in is this relationship, like she's talking about how she's building a system um, for building things by hand as the same way that you would build it by a 3D printer. What's the difference between using your hand and building an object compared to a 3D printer doing that for you. Um, so she does these kind of performances, and she's using this thing called a G-code, um, in which the, uh, the G-code allows her to kind of follow the process of an object being 3D printed. And then as she does these um, um, kind of like live performances, where there's a laser, as you can see maybe next to her hand, and um, the G-code allows this the kind of like, let's say something is being printed live, and then um, that gets transferred to this laser moving on, on the paper, and then she kind of do, do this like live performances and create these drawings, this 2D drawing out of this process. Um, but again, kind of thinking about these relationships between our bodies and object, and, and what is the difference between you know, this relationship of machine and object, and you kind of interfering uh, this, this, this process in a way. And then this is um, another project that I think we were very inspired by. This was, um, uh, it was first um, an exhibition at Victoria and Albert Museum in 2014, which was very timely. It came out after um, Arab Spring. And it's kind of thinking through objects, this, this kind of revolutionary or like object as uh, tools for social movement, right? So it's that you can see there that you can, for example, make um, a mask from these like water bottles um, and how you can use that, let's say, in a protest in summer, like in the Middle East. Again, if this was like happening right after like everything that happened in the Middle East. Um, and that 
thinking through these objects as, as objects that have these, this potential and how we can reappropriate them, um, I think was something that we were really interested in also through thinking, uh, these like political act and, and objects as, uh, as, as these tools for political act. But um, kind of going back to the point with, with violence, I think this is specifically interesting because it is not, it is kind of like defending yourself, you know, in, in these like situations, um, not necessarily like being violent, which I think is a very different take on provocative uh, or like radical ways that you can think about in general 3D printing. Um, so we are gonna kind of, these, from these things that we were inspired by, there's so many more, we're kind of just showing you three examples. So um, uh, yeah. our discussion started collecting some of these amazing projects that we knew existed in the world and being inspired by this. But we decided that it wasn't enough to just know about this. We should gather them together. We should put them in a place where people can access them. Um, so our discussion came to this, which is a very famous book released by William Powell um, in the 1970s. William Powell was a, a young, uh, radical thinker. He felt like his generation had been pursued um, in America by the government in, 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 in order to push people to go to war. And um, he believed that violence and knowledge was a way to, uh, um, to fight this. So he gathered a lot of material that he found in the library, uh, how to make bombs, how to hack uh, one-armed bandits, how to um, uh, make chemical warfare kind of, uh, like very dodgy things. But all the stuff was available. It was already there in the library. He gathered it together, produced this book, released it into the world. And obviously, um, this was a, an idea of radicality predicated on violence. But the thing about William Powell, for one, he later completely denounced this position. But, uh, but also, the anarchist cookbook, if you actually know anything about the contents of this book and look at the um, objects that are in there, a lot of them are incomplete. William Powell didn't really know what he was doing. And some of the stuff that he copied down and literally traced and drew kind of... Uh, drew his recipes and wrote them up, he missed stuff out. So the idea that this book was given to terrorists and they use it to incite the violence and to, and to break the state or whatever is fundamentally flawed from the beginning. But this book became very symbolic of, 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 of the terrorist position. And it was found in the, in the, in the, um, in the ownership of countless, countless uh, people who committed horrific acts. Um, now, the question really is whether this book promoted their position, it, it gave them the tools in order to enact their violence, or whether people felt disaffected from, for whatever reason, and they gravitated towards this book because it offered them something, it offered them some potential, it offered them some hope, something that was missing. And, and, and we believe that the second reason is, is really what makes this book um, radical. So we decided we wanted to make a a 3D printing cookbook. This is our beginning. But today, what is radical today? What is a radical act? Violence is not what we are interested in. We're interested in new forms of radicality, and this is where our conversation began. So we coined this term additivism, which is a combination of uh, the phrase uh, additive from additive manufacturing and activism. So in 3D printing, you begin from a small, uh, small pieces and you build up frame by frame to large consequences. And we saw this as had a metaphoric potential. So additivism is a form of activism which begins from small things and builds up to its planetary consequence. This is our conceit. And you can think of this in, as a metaphoric uh, turn in much the same way that Laura yeah. Devendorf was using the 3D printer as a metaphor. What happens when we rethink physicality, we rethink objects through the language of the 3D printer? What happens when we translate this very new technology into our bodies and into our way of being in the world? So we're gonna show you now our video. Um, we worked on this for a long time. We decided to make a call for people to submit to a radical 3D printing cookbook. Then that idea turned into a manifesto. Then we decided that the manifesto needed to be a video. Then we worked with a sound artist called Andrea Young, who did an extraordinary job of, of, of promoting our kind of strange uh, discourse. And we made this video, and we're going to show you this now. And as I say, we're going to unpack this after we've shown it. So I'm supposed to like go roll the VT like this. And uh, it's about 10 minutes long.
derived from petrochemicals boiled into being from the black oil of a trillion ancient bacterioles. The plastic used in 3D additive manufacturing is a metaphor before it has even been laid into shape. Its potential belies the complications of its history. That matter is the sum and prolongation of our ancestry. That creativity is brutal, sensual, rude, coarse and cruel. We declare that the world's splendour has been enriched by a new beauty. The beauty of crap, kipple and detritus. A planet crystallised with great plastic tendrils like serpents with pixelated breath. For a revolution that runs on disposable armaments is more desirable than the contents of Edward Snowden's briefcase. More breathtaking than the United Nations Legislative Series. There is nothing which our infatuated race would desire to see more than the fertile union between a man and an analytical engine. Yet humankind are the antediluvian prototypes of a far vaster creation. The whole of humankind can be understood as a biological medium of which synthetic technology is but one modality. Thought and life both have been thoroughly dispersed on the winds of information. Our power and intelligence do not belong specifically to us, but to all matter. Our technologies are the sex organs of material speculation. Any attempt to understand these occurrences is blocked by our own anthropomorphism. In order to proceed, therefore, one has to birth post-human machines, a phantasmagoric and unrepresentable repertoire of actual re-embodiments of the most hybrid kinds. Additivism will be instrumental in accelerating the emergence and encounter with the radical outside. Additivism can emancipate us. Additivism will eradicate us. We want to encourage, interfere and reverse engineer the possibilities encoded into the censored, the invisible and the radical notion of the 3D printer itself. To endow the printer with the faculties of plastic condensing imagination within material reality. The 3D print then becomes a symptom of a systemic malady, an aesthetics of exaptation, with the peculiar beauty to be found in reiteration, in making a mesh. This is where cruelty and creativity are reconciled in the appropriation of all planetary matter to innovate on biological prototypes. From the purest thermoplastic, from the cleanest photopolymer and shiniest scented metals, we propose to forge anarchy, revolt and distemper. Let us birth disarray from its digital chamber. To mobilize this entanglement, we propose a collective, one figured not only on the resolution of particular objects, but on the change those objects enable as instruments of revolution and systemic disintegration. Just as the printing press, radio, photocopier and modem were saturated with unintended affects, so we seek to express the potential encoded into every one of the 3D printer's gears. Just as a glitch can unresolve an image, so it can resolve something more post-human. Manifold systems, biological, political, computational, material. We call for planetary pixelization, using additivist technologies to corrupt the material unconscious. A call that goes on forever in virtue of this initial movement. We call not for passive, dead technologies, but rather for a gradual awakening of matter, the emergence, ultimately, of a new form of life. 
we call for the endless repenning of activist manifestos, artistic speculations on matter and its digital destiny, texts on the Anthropocene, the Chutuvocene, the Plasticine, designs, blueprints and instructions for 3D printing, tools of industrial espionage, tools for self-defense against armed assault, tools to disguise, tools to aid and disrupt surveillance, tools to raise and rebuild, objects beneficial in the promotion of protest and unrest, objects for sealing and detaining, torture devices, instruments of chastity and psychological derangement, sex machines, temporary autonomous drones, rad equipment used in the production of drugs, dietary supplements, DNA, photopolymers and thermoplastics, stem cells, nanoparticles, technical methods for the copying and dissemination of mass-produced components, artworks, or painted forms, the aura of individuals, corporations, and governments, software for the encoding of messages inside 3D objects, methods for the decryption of messages hidden inside 3D objects, chemical ingredients for dissolving or catalyzing 3D objects, hacks, cracks, and viruses for 3D print software, to avoid DRM, to introduce errors, glitches, and fissures into 3D prints, methods for the reclamation and recycling of plastic caught in oceanic gyres, lying dormant in landfills, developing nations, or the bodies of children, the enabling of biological and synthetic things to become each other's prostheses including skeletal cabling, nervous system inserts, lenticular neural tubing, universal ports, interfaces, and orifices. Added to this and indigenous methods for exacting androgynous bodies, including skin grafts, antlers, disposable exoskeletons, interspecies sex organs, Von Neumann probes and other cosmic contagions. Methods for binding 3D prints and the machines that produce them in quantum entanglement. Sacred items used during incantation and transcendence, including the private parts of gods and saints, idols, altars, quashikali, ectoplasm, nantag stones, the production of further mimetic forms, not limited to Vorpal Blades, Squirtles, Energon, Symmetriads, Asymmetriads, Capital, Junk, Love, Alephs, those that from a long way off look like flies. Life exists only in action. There is no innovation that has not an aggressive character. We employ you, radicals, revolutionaries, activists, additivists, to distill your distemper into texts, templates, blueprints, glitches, forms, algorithms, and components. Creation must be a violent assault on the forces of matter to extrude its shape and extract its raw potential. Having spilled from fissures fracked into Earth's deepest wells, the beyond now begs us to be molded to its will. And we shall drink every drop as entropic expenditure, and reify every accursed dream through algorithmic excess. For only additivism can accelerate us to an aftermath whence all matter has mutated into the clarity of plastic.
Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're going to no. unpack this, and it, I mean, it, it's, um, it's so exciting to have had Heather's talk before, because I think there's so much inherent in what Heather's talking about that hopefully is kind of sitting in your head already, and you can see that our kind of contradictory language brings up some of this stuff. Just put, just put it back on there and then do the... Yeah, yeah. Thing. We don't need the notes on here. I, I need the notes there. But you can look, see on here now. Okay. So we, we created the manifesto and we put out into the world and we had a lot of submissions of strange, weird, crazy work. Not just 3D print stuff, um, stuff from the bio, our hacking community, <laughs> Um, a lot of different uh, texts, and we're, we're, we're gathering this stuff together. We'll be working on this later this year to, um, to edit the cookbook and eventually bring it out. Um, but yeah, so this is stage two of three that we're at at the moment. Um, so as we're talking about the kind of metaphoric potential of these technologies, um, one of the things about the 3D printer is that it's, it's very much in its primitive form, if that's the right way to talk about it. But 3D printing is now becoming uh, a technology that sits between a lot of different material processes. Plastic is the most well-known material, but 3D printers can uh, produce metal, uh, wood, uh, concrete. Um, and th this thing in the top here, this produces um, simple proteins that can, then can be used to manufacture drugs. So the idea is eventually you'd be able to send a digital file in an email the way that you send your 3D printed object and then you could print uh, the drugs on demand using very simple additive uh, processes. So there's something fundamentally interesting about this technology that sits between all of these different materialities. And it, it brings us back to Donna Haraway, whose name has come up a lot this last couple of days. Um, you'll all know her work, the Cyborg Manifesto, from the early 80s. And um, I'm not going to unpack this properly. There's contradictions to be unpacked here, and there's a, there's a, a lot of uh, feminist discourse that's hidden in this uh, phrase. But her idea about uh, bodies and interfaces, about different kinds of materiality, different kinds of being, uh, being able to interface as long as they have a common language. This is really an interesting position for us because we think that, that the 3D printer is becoming a common language or it has the potential to be a common language or it's talked about in utopian terms that make it seem as if it's going to be a common language. So our question is, well, what happens to notions of radicality in using these technologies if we start to consider this technology in this kind of common form? What is produced? Um, obviously, as we see from Heather's talk, uh, plastic is hugely uh, related uh, to this kind of material uh, speculation. Um, and we take this as a kind of metaphoric beginning point for our conversation. We're not just interested in the, in material, uh, the material of plastic, but we think that by using this, um, and we did in our, as we did in our manifesto, as a kind of metaphoric backbone for a, a whole range of conversations, if we unpack the influence of plastic and its relation to these 3D printing processes, we can start to consider how to use not just 3D printers, but other technologies in kind of new radical ways. So, um, this is the cycle of plastic, as we all know. Millions of years ago, sea creatures died, sank to the bottom of the ocean. They got compressed over millions of years, turned into crude oil. We suck that up out of the ocean. We use some of it to power our machines, and we extrude some of it into plastic, and then we 3D print this amazing uh, commemorative Leonard Nimoy uh, hand, which I found on a 3D printing website recently. And then this sits on your desk, and then when you die and your children find this, they throw it into the ocean, uh, and <laughs> it floats to Hawaii. And uh, millions and millions of years from now, the Leonard Nimoy uh, commemorative hand still there in the geological record. So we want to continue to think about this as a process that doesn't end in the future. This is something ongoing. And this brings us back to another Donna Haraway position. Uh, Donna Haraway's recent work on the idea of the Anthropocene is to uh, weird this term. And she uh, argues that we shouldn't be calling it the Anthropocene because this collapses this kind of vast global moment 
um, back on us, back on humans, back on the now, back on this time. So she proposes this thing, the Thulu scene. And there's various ways to unpack this. One of them is to go back to H.P. Lovecraft and his figure of Thulu, uh, which is a kind of these dark gods that lived in the underworld that were waiting to emerge and take our, you know, and kill mankind. The other one is to think of the Thlonic, to think of uh, in an etymological sense. And this is the, the underworld itself, the things that live in the dirt, in the ground. Um, this is a spider that, um, that um, Donna Haraway proposes as kind of figure of the Thulu scene. And if the Thulu, uh, Thulu in the H.P. Lovecraft sense is kind of the male part of this horrific figure, then the spider is very much kind of more the female, or we can see this kind of as a, as a range of different gender types and different uh, positions. So the, the spider, uh, and she says, it's connected to the primal goddess, it's familiar with darkness, it weaves the ground, it entraps, it snares, it has quick reflex, it reflexes. It's a weaving, creating figure. Um, okay. I could talk more about the kind of racist history of Thulu, but maybe this is the kind of thing that can come up in the, the question and answers. And so Donna Haraway says that if we consider the Thulu scene, this changes this notion of the Anthropocene collapsing on us right now, and it expands out this potential. So if we think about uh, deep time, about uh, time stretching back and time stretching forward, these sea creatures now are the, the exact creatures that we are extruding into these nightmarish, horrific shapes. Yeah? We are using their bodies to create what we create. And millions of years from now, what we leave behind will become the kind of remnant of the deep futures. And in a, in a, on a Harrowayan sense, these ancient creatures have just as much right to exist as we have now. And whatever remains millions of years from now, whatever evolves in the plastosphere, with it, with, you know, in, the, in the world that we leave behind, those creatures have just as much right to exist as we do now. So Donna Haraway's Thulu scene expands that kind of point out to the deep time and the deep future. Okay, so I'm not going to go into this because um, Heather did this much more beautifully. So... This notion of uh, fluid outside, which we have in our title, this comes from a, a text that I'm, I, I absolutely love, written by Luciana Parisi and Tiziana Terranova in uh, 2000. And they go back to some of the work of uh, Luce uh, Irigaray, and uh, they talk about thermodynamics, the cycle of thermodynamics. And Irigaray posits the, the woman's body and the reproductive cycle at a point between kind of life and death. So the body of the woman gives energy to the thermodynamic cycle, produces life, uh, and, and, uh, and, we, and society kind of functions by taking the energy from the, the woman's body, essentially, in order to produce more people, more workers, more, more, more society. And they use this phrase, the female body is a fluid outside, which in turn lends energy to the thermodynamic cycle. So the idea of this is, it, it's not just about female bodies. The idea is that the things which power society, which power our, our existence as kind of techno-capitalistic beings, these things are very much on the outside, and they have been for a long time. We appropriated the work and the bodies of, in, in the colonial history, uh, slavery, uh, the bodies of women, the bodies of animals, these kind of non-human creatures that lend energy to the thermodynamic cycle that powers and drives our existence. But as Iri Garay says, um, the, although the woman connects the end to the beginning of life, the end and the beginning are not hers. So the people on the outside, the things on the outside which drive progress, the future will not be theirs. It's not theirs, the, the future that's produced is not going to be theirs. I mean, again, this is very much inherent in um, Heather's talk. We see this, we could come up with a thousand examples in this kind of anthropocenic sense of this taking place. At the moment, there's this uh, craze in China for the gills of manta rays, and they believe that by taking these gills as a medicine, it removes impurities from the body. And these manta rays live off the coast of Indonesia. There's a small island called Lombok, and the entire community of Lombok has become integrated into the global system through 
catching manta rays, extracting the gills, and selling them on the Chinese market. Now, these people know that they are destroying not only their livelihood, but the nature that they live amongst. They know this is happening. They know that the manta rays are getting less and less and less. Okay? But they still continue to do this because in this global system that we've produced, this is the only way that they have to survive. Okay? So the future is not for them. It's not for them. It's not for the manta rays. It's not for the people of Indonesia. Uh, the, the, the progress that gets produced is elsewhere. These people are on the outside. These beings are on the outside. So we, we're considering this through various different means. But one is to go back to this idea that Heather gestured to about these kind of uh, um, utopian ideas of future and progress. One of the uh, groups of people that consider technology as liberating are the transhumanists. This is Zoltan Istvan, who is actually running for president in the US. If you're not into uh, Hillary or Trump or, uh, or um, Bernie Sanders, you can go down the transhumanist route if you like. <laughs> so uh, Zoltan Istvan wrote this article last year in which he was reacting to the news that, and I forget the city, but there's a city in the US that wanted to spend a certain amount of millions of dollars on, um, on integrating uh, things into the city that help disabled people navigate the streets. So uh, to make it more wheelchair accessible, um, we all know these kind of ways that design is used to, to help uh, people with disabilities to flatten the plane. Zoltan wrote this article that said, no, we shouldn't be supporting people's disabilities, we should be repairing them. Take the millions of dollars that you're gonna use to uh, design the city and use it to repair disabilities. Now, of course, this is hugely problematic not only because it kind of promotes a sort of body imperialism, a kind of body fascism, um, but also this idea that there is a norm to which we can all ascribe, i.e. norm, the white, the white male, the white rich Californian-based transhumanist, and then from that norm we can lift ourselves together into some great utopian future, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, so this is maybe the vision that we have of this grand utopian future where we're all augmented by our machines. Perhaps we'd like to suggest that there's alternate possibilities out there. There's alternate forms of body embodiment, alternate modes of expressing ourselves. And, and this is a fantastic project by Kylie and Cal that gestures very much to the kind of uh, Haraway and uh, Thulusini kind of imagery. But we're very interested in this as a notion of what is the norm to which we are trying to ascribe, trying to counteract, trying to weird. If you put the word human into Google image search, this is what comes up. There's a whole range of white dudes. Now you can do this with the word hand as well. If you put hand into Google, it's a lot of white hands. If you put the word selfie into Google, it's a lot of young, uh, attractive white females taking pictures of their face. This is uh, an expression of our algorithmic culture, but it shows conditions of how we have normalized certain notions of ourselves and what needs to be kind of moved against. This is, of course, another transhumanist, uh, Ray Kurzweil, who wrote this very famous book, The Singularity is Near. And his idea is that we are driving towards this great heap of technological progress that will eventually lift us up into this great future where technology is, tra is moving so fast and changing so quickly that it, the whole of reality will transform and turn into this thing called a singularity beyond which we will uh, walk into the grand future where everybody is white and rich and Western and male. Um, but digitally, or I, I don't even understand. Um, <laughs> But we would like to suggest that what we're actually moving towards is not the singularity, but the crapularity, okay? This is a term coined by Justin Picard, but we really take this seriously, okay? This is Heather's future that, we, that she was very much talking about. The same processes that drive that technological development, that create that drive, that take from the fluid outside and pump it into that, 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 uh, that escalating grand uh, ascribed to some amazing future, those same energy processes are the same processes which are producing the crap which is going out into the environment and completely altering everything, okay? The crapularity is something that we do not want to fight against. We want to embrace the crapularity, okay? Maybe this, again, is the part of Heather's point, to, to take this notion of toxicity within ourselves and produce queer alternatives that allow this 
alternate notion of our future to be productive, even though it might remove what it is we consider to be human about ourselves, or what, you know, Ray Kursar considers to be human about ourselves. <laughs> And this is the, the major point. We're already living in a previous crapularity, okay? Those sea creatures that died and sank to the bottom of the ocean, they died and left a world behind that was not capable for them to live in, you know? The toxicities of their bodies influenced the world that came after it. And without that crapularity, the world that we know as it exists now could never have existed. Crapularities happen all the time. and They've happened throughout the history of life on this planet, and they will continue to happen. This is the norm. This is the norm that we have to, uh, we have to get into our brains. It's a norm which is already weird, and it's weird because it's weird to us and uh, in our human senses. But we need to, we need to free ourselves from, from that humanness in order to achieve... Uh, kind of an, a real notion of radicality that gestures to forms of action beyond this point. Okay, so <laughs> we're coming back now to uh, a lot of our kind of the text, uh, the research that went into our manifesto, and Morrison is going to talk a little bit about uh, Reza Nagarastani, whose work also kind of leaks back into this notion of the crapularity, we think. Yeah, also kind of this, the ideas around food outside and radical outside, which is a term we use in the manifesto, and also it's related to some of your research. So when we were working on um, the manifesto text, one of the things that uh, we started to get a lot of inspirations from was um, this book by Rosanna Garstani, which is called Cyclonopedia, Complexity with Anonymous Materials. And this is the first um, horror sci-fi book ever written on the Middle East. And um, I, it's, it's a very different experience to read it, let's say, as an Iranian, like understanding a lot of like Islamic and cultural um, symbols that are in there, but also like these relationships that he's trying to uh, bring together between um, petropolitics, techno-capitalism, jihad, and, and oil. Um, so when reading this text, one of the things that um, I think was, was really interesting to us was this introduction um, of jihad as the pole against which techno-capitalism rages. So where the jihadists draw occupying forces into urban environments, resulting in cities being torn apart, reduced to dust. So rather than wishing the war missions of the US war to leave the Middle East, extreme Islamist guiding principle is to keep the US war machine to destroy idols, returning everything back to the desert. And this is a concept that he talks about as desertification and also dustism. Um, so a lot of this kind of, uh, this maybe like this whole idea of the, the, the uh, crapularity and also um, the horror that we are living in, right? And you were t uh, talking about the, uh, this idea of toxicity, right? It's like th this, this world that we are living in. He talks about it from a very different standpoint. He comes to it as talking about how, how terrorists and jihadists are basically um, bombing and destroying everything because they have this ideology of flattening the earth, the planet, as a way to restart everything, right? Um, and this was something that was really in interesting, specifically in the research that I was doing um, kind of at the end of, uh, the end of our, our manifesto, uh, thinking about this relationship between desertification and flattening to a process like additive process, like 3D printing, kind of uh, in, in a metaphoric way, in a poetic way, but what does it mean to build layer by layer or rebuild something that is, that is destroyed? Um, so around this time, I, I was doing kind of this, this research, and again, like we were in a lot of conversation around, around these ideas, and um, a video of, of ISIS destroying the, the artifacts at Mosul Museum came out. I'm sure some of you know about this, maybe some of you have even seen the video, which was, it, it, it got brought down like a week or maybe like five, six days after it was released online by ISIS. Um, but kind of as a continuum of my, the first project that I was talking about, which was dark matter, and then uh, the text and, and research that uh, we, we were working on with, with the additivism, the first thing that I, I thought about was um, how can you respond to something like this? What does it mean, this idea of archiving and documenting and being able to rebuild something that, that, is, that is destroyed? So this destruction 
um, happened, but kind of before I kind of go more in detail into the process and my work in relationship to this, maybe going a little bit back to oil and, and um, the influence of oil basically in, in the formation of uh, a group of like ISIS. So since ISIS emerged um, on the scene in Syria in 2013, long before they reached Mosul in Iraq, Mosul is where they destroyed these artifacts, uh, the jihadists saw oil as a crutch for their vision for an Islamic state. ISIS uh, Shura Council believed that oil is fundamental for the survival of of the insurgency and more importantly to finance their ambition to create a caliphate. ISIS brought uh, hundreds of trucks in from Kir um, Kirkuk and Mosul and they started to extract the oil and export it. ISIS has made an estimated 450 million from oil in the 10 months that it controlled the area. Um, but also that is not just a problem, right? It's the problem is the demand for oil, this like techno capitalism, like all these all these relationships, this this cycle that we live in. Um, but also, obviously, like the formation of ISIS as a, as a jihadist group, which is a direct influence of um, U.S. invasion of uh, of Iraq. And we should say maybe that about, I think apparently 25% of crude oil goes towards the production of plastic. Yeah, that's just a figure yeah. that I've heard a few times. So when, when this demand is not just to power machines; it, it very much is to power our uh, plastic uh, culture. So. When I, I started doing a lot of research around the area, um, this area that is called Hatra, or the city called Hatra, where a lot of artifacts that were destroyed were from this city and also a Syrian um, era. And um, again, kind of going back to this idea of desertification and, and, and dustism, and kind of thinking about ISIS Act, this kind of her that everyone had watching this video, like, there was a lot of sadness for archaeologists, historians, people in the Middle East, etc., um, as watching these things being destroyed. So I started to do a lot of research around um, these, these uh, artifacts, trying to find their names, trying to find where which one was original, which one was uh, duplicate. Because when, when this happened, there were a lot of articles that came out talking about like how uh, some of these were duplicates, and there's like an original one saved at a museum, at Baghdad Museum in Iraq. Um, and as I was continuing my research to understand what really happened, I realized that there is very little information available about these artifacts. You would think for artifacts that are 2,500, 3,000 years old, you would be able to find a lot of information around them, which is not true. And I was doing my research in, in, in Farsi and, and Arabic and English and finding very little um, information about them, even, even about them, their names, like all these things that wouldn't match up. A name in Arabic would be something different or wrong in, in English. So I started contacting a lot of historians and scholars in Iran and, and Iraq and, and the US and Europe to try to bring together this information, kind of... Um, um, the, the conversation yesterday about research uh, as this process uh, of, of art practice, that became such an important aspect of my project. So I, I did this research for a year and also like the reproduction of artifacts, etc., etc. So um, this is, for example, c kind of came to me in the middle of my research when I finally got a hold of some of the former staff of Mosul Museum and was able to like find an actual list which is also incomplete. But that's also because the, the, the museum, the Mosul Museum in Iraq, has been underfunded and understaffed, um, and Iraq has been under war for many, many years now. Um, so I started uh, choosing some of these artifacts that I wanted to work on and doing research on them, and 3D printing them. So this is a material called resin, and it's clear resin. But because this kind of notion of research was really important in the process of um, working on this project, I have embedded these memory cards and flash drives inside the artifacts. So you can think about them as these ideas of time capsule, um, and that you can have access to this information um, that, that are kept. So this information include like PDF files, images, all my email correspondence with, with scholars uh, that I've had, um, and then OBJ and STL files, which will allow these things, if you have access to a 3D printer, to be printed again. Um, one very common question that I get all the time is, is that, do you have to destroy this to, to get into it? No, like the way that I've worked on it is like kind of like these are sealed, so you could, um, it won't be like easy, and that's the idea. Like I don't want, like it's the time capsule, so, but you can remove this plug and bring out the, the artifacts, uh, I'm sorry, the memory cards from the artifacts. 
So I'm just very quickly going to go through some of them. There are 12 of them. I just last week had a solo exhibition where I displayed all of them, or, or two weeks ago, um, for the first time. So this is my studio. These are I'll, 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 and I started really like developing these relationships with with these characters and, and people. You know, I was spending kind of a lot of time remodeling them. The whole remodeling process was really complicated because I had to do it from scratch because I couldn't go just 3D scan it. It was already lost. Um, and reading about them and then when you 3D print something and bring it out of a support material, you have to like clean it. So it was this like very interesting emotional moments where I would bring this out th from the printer and then it had the support material and it was this act of digging it out and bringing it out and it felt like very archaeological in a way. So it was very important for me to develop this kind of relationship with, with the work and research I was doing. And um, this kind of, to go back maybe to additivism, I think this is a very good example and a very good way that you can think about an example of what maybe additivism is about or, ca or can be about. Um, in a kind, and kind of after this first series, I started to become more and more interested in also the, the female figures, exactly because of articles like this that I was, that I was reading, that only 13 life-size statues of, of mortal women are known from Hatra compared to 120 um, of, of, of the men. Um, artifacts, and that was very important for me because, like, obviously, yes, women always get lost in history, and um, to reconstruct this, it was very important for me to be, to actually focus back on this more and then like be more selective about the female artifacts that were lost. Um, but also thinking not not just that history, but like really thinking about the act of destruction. I think ISIS destroying these female bodies, it's a very different politics that is embedded in that, right? Because of kind of this relationship between female body, the nude artifact of female body, and then Islam, and this like the female body being a property of, of men, um, et cetera. And also like maybe we'll bring it back to food outside in a bit, and that, that kind of relationship. So I'm gonna go through this faster. <laughs> and I, I wanna talk about Gorgons because Maybe I will do this also, like after. But but Donna Harvey talks about Gorgons as as you know this kind of between male and female um, because it's different than Medusa. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of discussion. Like right there, you can see the beard, and also it has, but the hair also like shows some kind of kind of um, male female figure. Um, but that horror, that darkness, that. Um, maybe Daniel was a little bit talking about, but being able to embrace this, as Donna Harvey talks about this specifically, talking about how um, instead of kind of thinking about these figures as fear uh, or dreadful figures, we should actually embrace this kind of fear. We are living in a time that we need to rethink about this kind of like darkness and our relationship to them. Yeah. So again, examples. Okay, so the last kind of part that I want to talk about is that um, giving access to public of, of all, all of these things that I've gathered. I think one very, that openness that we talked about of some of the projects like Golan Levins has been really important for me. And, and this problem that um, I think I've, in many ways I've been dealing with since I've been working on this project. Again, it's something that has been developed in, in the process of rethinking and working more and more on this project. But um, one very important problem with a projects like this that are reconstructing um, this cultural heritage, you might have seen a lot of projects that are, that are doing that, right? Like these tech companies going to the Middle East or Africa and saving the cultural heritage. And I think we really need, do need to think about what we're doing exactly. And this relationship between digital colonialism and 3D scanning, everyone is really excited about this technology. But I think there is, we're, there's a serious issue to think about because a lot of these things that are being 3D scanned, nobody knows where, where these files are ending up in. The museums and these tech companies that have them, and um, there's like this whole thing on copyright when they go and, and 3D scan them. And this is a conversation that I think is very, very important to have in relationship to access to these digital files. It's not, this isn't, it's like, you know, that moment that internet came back out and everyone was like, wow, this is so free and awesome. And I think it's the same kind of perspective to 3D scanning, which, which is not true. 
So um, this orienting for me as an artist working on this project, it's been also really important to think where these artifacts go because I think as soon as you put it in a museum in the West and just have the, let them have it as an archive, it totally kind of changes and you disorient it in a place that it, it doesn't belong. And I think there's, there's, there's also a big um, ethical issue in, in many ways for me. So um, I, last week I released all the information that I've gathered um, uh, online through Rhizome and New Museum and also one of the OBJ files. Um, but at the kind of like one of the last points I'm making about this project and kind of how complicated it is to work on something like this. So I'm, I'm being from Iran, I think a lot of things happened uh, kind of at the middle of my project, including Paris attack, obviously the, the Syrian crisis has been happening for a while, but all of this had a really big influence in the way that my project politically was, was being taken, right? Kind of like using that as a way to say, oh look, all these like t people you're letting to go to your country and look, they're terrorists and look this, look at this, this artist who's fighting ISIS and showing you these things, which is totally like not what my project is about. But I, they, like one of the things that I constantly started like getting about um, how this project is, is fighting ISIS. Um, so this, a lot of people like send me this and they're very excited about it. And I don't know how to tell them like how much I, I hate this project. Um, but this is the problem. This is the problem. It's kind of like, you know, the idea of Malala being taken from these like brown men and being safe in the US. It's a completely similar situation. So the Westerner, the white people, the white men, these like tech companies saving these things and bringing it back and putting it in Times Square or in London and, um, completely removing their influence actually on the very first reason of why these things has happened through like a like a group like ISIS. So this is something that takes us back to horror and um, these, these things that we're experiencing, right, we we're living in this like very specific time and there are new things that are happening around us. And maybe you can say some, some stuff about her and then I will go back to it. So yeah, we, 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 need, we need to wrap up, we've gone over time. Um, but um, I mean, thank you for listening to our kind of meandering conversation. And I think that there is something in this kind of position of horror that hopefully leaks all these things back together. We're living in a very horrific time for various reasons, environmental reasons, reasons of uh, state, reasons of control, reasons of representation. And all of these things do leak back to a, a very simple set of things, which is you know, techno-capitalism, oil, its movement and production, the notion of technological progress, powering our machines, modes of innovation, modes of making. We want to take that harrowing position of staying with the trouble and turn this into a kind of proposition um, that forms of practice today, forms of radicality, in, in opposition to, say, the anarchist cookbook where violence was the thing that could be used to liberate people from control of the state. Today, we see horror as a mode of engaging with uh, the limitations of our society. And if we can uh, grab hold of horror and weirdness and use it to kind of queer alternative futures, alternative ways of action, and always be constantly exposing the horror which is inherent in those processes, which is embedded within them, as long as we foreground that, then it, it's okay to use 3D printers, it's okay to work with this technology to produce as long as we are constantly kind of engaging with the horror. Um, maybe we should just finish, I think. Yeah, we can, we can kind of... Yeah, so we are gonna be in that, residence yeah. in Berlin in the summer and that's where we'll be finishing the cookbook and we would really urge you to go and have a look at our website and kind of um, we haven't talked about some of the projects that were submitted to us today, and this is like a big absent, but that weirdness is really important to us, and we're hoping that additivism can kind of become a kind of parasitic organism and leach into some of the discourse around 3D printing and around notions of using technology uh, in action. But um, thank you so much for yeah, listening thanks. to us. Am I taking it?